A wants another horse for his wagon. He doesn't have the money to buy one, but since Pioneer B has an extra horse, he decides that he's entitled to share in his neighbor's good fortune. Is he entitled to take his neighbor's horse? Obviously not. If his neighbor wishes to give it or lend it, that is another question. But so long as Pioneer B wishes to keep his property, Pioneer A has no just claim to it. If A has no proper power to take B's property, can he delegate any such power to the sheriff? No. Even if everyone in the community desires that B give his extra horse to A, they have no right individually or collectively to force him to do it. They cannot delegate a power they themselves do not have. This important principle was clearly understood and explained by John Locke nearly 300 years ago in these words. For nobody can transfer to another more power than he has in himself, and nobody has an absolute arbitrary power over himself or over any other to destroy his own life or take away the life or property of another. This means, then, that the proper function of government is limited only to those spheres of activity within which the individual citizen has the right to act. Putting its just powers from the governed, government becomes primarily a mechanism for defense against bodily harm, theft, and involuntary servitude. It cannot claim the power to redistribute the wealth or first force reluctant citizens to perform acts of charity against their will. Government is created by man. No man possesses such power to delegate. The creature cannot exceed the creator. In general terms, therefore, the proper role of government includes such defensive activities as maintaining national, military, and local police forces for protection against loss of life, loss of property, and loss of liberty at the hands of either foreign despots or domestic criminals. It also includes those powers necessarily incidental to the protective function, such as, one, the maintenance of courts, where those charged with crime and where disputes between citizens may be impartially settled and two, the establishment of a monetary system and a standard of weights and measures so that courts may render money judgments, taxing authorities may levy taxes, and citizens may have a uniform standard to use in their business dealings. My attitude toward government is succinctly expressed by the following provision taken from the Alabama Constitution that the sole object and only legitimate end of government is to protect the citizen in the enjoyment of life, liberty, and property. And when the government assumes other functions, it is usurpation and oppression. An important test I use in passing judgment upon an act of government is this. If it were up to an individual to punish my neighbor for violating a given law, would it offend my conscience to do so? Since my conscience will never permit me to physically punish my fellow man unless he has done something evil, or unless he has failed to do something which I have a moral right to require of him to do, I will never knowingly authorize my agent, the government, to do this on my behalf. I realize that when I give my consent to the adoption of a law, I specifically instruct the police, the government, to take either the life, liberty, or property of anyone who disobeys that law. Furthermore, I tell them that if anyone resists the enforcement of the law, they are to use any means necessary 
Yes, even putting the lawbreaker to death or putting him in jail to overcome such resistance. These are extreme measures, but unless laws are enforced, anarchy results. As John Locke explained many years ago, the end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. For in all the states of created beings capable of laws, where there is no law, there is no freedom. For liberty is to be free from restraint and violence from others, which cannot be where there is no law, and is not, as we are told, a liberty for every man to do what he lists. For who could be free when every other man's humor might dominate over him? But a liberty to dispose and order freely as he lists his person, actions, possessions, and his whole property within the allowance of those laws under which he is, and therein not be subject to the arbitrary will of another, but freely follow his own. We Americans should use extreme care before lending our support to any proposed government program. We should fully recognize that government is no plaything. As George Washington warned, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. It is an in instrument of force, and unless our conscience is clear, that we would not hesitate to put a man to death, put him in jail, or forcibly deprive him of his property for failing to obey a given law, we should oppose it. Another standard I use in determining what law is good and what is bad is the Constitution of the United States. I regard this inspired document as a solemn agreement between the citizens of this nation which every officer of government is under sacred duty to obey. As Washington stated so clearly in his immortal farewell address, the basis of our political systems is the right of the people to make and to alter their constitutions of government. But the Constitution, which at any time exists, until changed by an explicit and authentic act of the whole people, is sacredly obligatory upon all. The very idea of the power and the right of the people to establish government presuppose the duty of every individual to obey the established government. I am especially mindful that the Constitution provides that the great bulk of the legitimate activities of government are to be carried out at the state or local level. This is the only way in which the principle of self-government can be made effective. As James Madison said before the adoption of the Constitution, we rest all our political experiments on the capacity of for self-government. Thomas Jefferson made this interesting observation. Sometimes it is said that man cannot be trusted with government of himself. Can he then be trusted with the government of others? Or have we found angels in the farms of kings to govern him? Let history answer this question. It is a firm principle that the smallest or lowest level that can possibly undertake the task is the one that should do so. First, the community or city. If the city cannot handle it, then the county. Next, the state. And only if no smaller unit can possibly do the job should the federal government be considered. <laughs> this is merely the application to the field of politics of that wise and time-tested principle of never asking a to do that which can be done by a smaller group. And so far as government is concerned, the smaller the unit and the closer it is to the people, the easier it is to guide it, to correct it, to keep it solvent, and to keep our freedom.
Thomas Jefferson understood this principle very well and explained it this way. The way to have good and safe government is not to trust it all to one, but to divide it among the many, distributing to every one exactly the function he is competent to. Let the national government be entrusted with the defense of the nation and its foreign and federal relations. The state government with the civil rights, law, police, and administration of what concerns the state generally. The counties with the local concerns of the counties. And each ward direct the within itself. It is by dividing and subdividing these republics from the great national one down through all its subordinations until it ends in the administration of every man's farm by himself by placing under every one what his own eye may superintend, that all will be done for the best. What has destroyed liberty and the rights of man in every government which has ever existed under the sun, the generalizing and concentrating all cares and powers into one body. It is well to remember that the states of this republic created the federal government. The federal government did not create the states. A category of government activity which today not only requires the closest scrutiny, but which also poses a great danger to our continued freedom, is the activity not within the proper sphere of government. No one has authority to grant such powers as welfare programs, schemes for redistributing the wealth, and activities which coerce people into acting in accordance with a prescribed code of social planning. There is one simple test. Do I as an individual have a right to use force upon my neighbor to accomplish this goal? If I do have such a right, then I may delegate that power to my government to exercise it on my behalf. If I do not have that right as an individual, then I cannot delegate it to governments, and I cannot ask my government to perform the act for me. To be sure, there are times when this principle of the proper role of government is most annoying and inconvenient. If I could only force the ignorant to provide for themselves, or the selfish to be their wealth, but if we permit government to manufacture its own authority out of thin air and to create self-proclaimed powers not delegated to it by the people, then the creature exceeds the creator and becomes master. Beyond that point, where shall we draw the line? Who is to say this far, but no farther? What clear principle will stay the hand of government? from reaching farther and yet farther into our daily lives. We shouldn't forget the wise words of President Grover Cleveland, that though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. We should also remember that nothing can enter the public treasury for the benefit of one citizen or one class, unless other citizens and classes have been forced to send it in. As Bastia pointed out over a hundred years ago, once government steps over this clear line between the protective or negative role into the, into the aggressive role of redistributing the wealth and providing so-called benefits for some of its citizens, it then becomes a means for what is accurately described as legalized plunder. It becomes a lever of unlimited power, which is, sought, which is the sought-after prize of unscrupulous individuals and pressure groups, each seeking to control the machine to fatten his own pockets or to benefit its favorite charities, all with the other fellow's money, of course. Listen to Bastia's explanation of this legal plunder. When a portion of the wealth is transferred from one person who owns it without his consent and 